Welcome on Punchline Talks, the big interview. My name is Mark and today my special guest is television presenter, mechanic, motor specialist and inventor. He's appeared on Top Gear, Wheeler Dealers, Auto Trader, Scrap Heat Challenge, Fifth Gear. He's fantastic, successful YouTuber. Welcome, Ed Charles, to <laughs> Punchline Talks. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's good to, good to be here. Thank you very much. That's a, quite an introduction. I think you missed out pulling power. Well, I'm not going to hold you to that. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. Well, I, I, I mean, I was watching one of the videos. You have millions and millions of, of viewers that you've achieved yeah. over the years. How many shows have you actually made for YouTube? Well, I think it's, yeah, it's got to be, it's getting near 100, which doesn't sound that many. But obviously, when you think, so back in the day when we were doing wheeler dealers, it would take about eight weeks per sort of car, roughly. And we, and when we first started YouTube, we were doing probably, I guess, one a week. And and then so it's the same amount of effort, same amount of filming and everything else, same amount of content. Maybe except we're doing it in slightly higher grades. We're doing it all in 4K, um, you know, and obviously spending far too much time with the lighting and stuff. So it really is. I mean, it nearly killed us the first year because we were working far too hard, if you like, to try and get the the, the thing there. But actually. What's interesting about YouTube is in the, you, the viewers like all kinds of different sort of aspects. And it's a really great place to be creative because you can do, you can film stuff on an iPhone, you can film stuff with sporty cameras um, and, and it can, it's all valid, you know, and, and I guess the audience are, are normally, they don't hold back when they want to tell you a good thing or a bad thing. That's the thing about the comments. So like when we were again doing a TV show, it was kind of interesting because it would take, you know, you might not even hear about the show for another six months when you meet someone at a show. Whereas with YouTube, it's like in 30 seconds of your video going up, they've already got something to say. So it's quite, it's quite, um, it was a bit of a baptism of fire, frankly, when we first got into it. <laughs> I mean, how much of the show is actually scripted? Because a lot of people think, you know, because that's the, that's the secret of it, isn't it? To make it not look scripted, but there's a lot of work going on. It's a bit of a bone of contention, to be honest. So, so my wife, Imogen, is um, very keen that we actually script everything. And it does save a huge amount of time. So if you actually know what you're going to say and you know the right way to say it, and then also the shots you're going to get, then you can save tons of time. As it happens, for most of the time up to now, we've been winging a lot of it. So we kind of know where we're going. We know roughly what's going on. But I find I, I find it hard to learn a script and then say it, you know, sort of as, as it's written. So I'm much better at um, you know, having a bullet point, having an idea about where we're headed, and off we go. But the problem is that that means you normally have to do three or four takes to say it right the last time, hopefully. And But also, you know, you suddenly remember you've forgotten something. So I'm trying to work on a hybrid now. I'm, 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 you know, you're always learning. I think the thing with, with, you know, obviously all the years of doing TV with Discovery, it was obviously very professional and stuff. But then... Uh, with the YouTube thing, it was, as I say, you've got the opportunity to do things differently. So we found a number of ways of making things more efficient um, and, and sort of changing that workflow, uh, which was which was vital, um, you know, to actually to get it to be possible. But one of those things which I'm still working on is actually finding that kind of happy medium between having a well sort of written show without having the rigid script, but still knowing exactly what the shots are and what you're going to do. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun thing because it just kind of like, I guess you're always chasing a tail. You're always trying to work out how to do it better next time. So, <laughs> no, so the, the thing about it is, is, I always think on YouTube, and uh, it, it's not to make it too too slick, too much like TV, because you can kind of get away with it then, can't you? Well, actually, I think you agree. I, th I think one of the interesting things is that a lot of people watch YouTube because they want that kind of slightly behind the scenes feel, you know, kind of almost breaking the fourth wall thing. But also, I come, you know, we've been doing that for so long. It's almost like it's muscle memory, you know. So, so. I find it easier to talk to camera, you know, if, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody standing behind it, but it's much better because it will be in focus. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and things like that. And it's obviously with YouTube, I think the, the most important thing is sound. If, you, if you've got a terrible sound, you know, it's worth spending a couple of quid on a microphone. You don't have to spend much, but if you nail the sound, then uh, I think then everything else is almost forgiven. Obviously, if the lighting's a bit rubbish on that shot, it's okay. Um, but I think really, that's the, that's the first place, but of course it is a visual medium. Um, but I think it, there is something that you are given a little bit of extra rope, I think, because the audience like to see you make a mistake or they like to see you kind of, uh, it is like when you're thinking about something. And I think that feeling of being more connected with you is probably quite, you know, quite powerful. And I think, again, that's something perhaps we could do more of going forwards. Cause obviously we, you know, we sort of, when we first set out to be, to be fair, we tried to do TV, but on YouTube. Um, and I think we're going to steer more towards doing more YouTube for YouTube because that makes more sense, right? <laughs> well, it just certainly makes sense. I mean, the, the <laughs> thing is really is, is how to make money out of it as well. I mean, we're a business-to-business -business publication. Yeah. I think that's the secret yeah, yeah, yeah. of YouTube. So, so if you don't mind me asking, 
how do you make your your money? Is it sponsorship? Is it like the likes of Big Doug? Is it is it other kinds of forms? How does it work? Yeah, well, it's it's actually it's it's quite a mix, and I think that's the thing is you can't rely on any one source for sure. And I think our show um, we set out to try and do it slightly differently, so we try to have a sort of a raft of sponsors um, at the beginning to actually pay for different aspects of that. And they're all almost like a Formula One team. So you've got all these different things and different kind of companies. If you've got RWC, who obviously do things like airlines and stuff to go around the workshop, but they also do a load of other products, which is why we did a polar bear, you know, around Christmas, because we made a bar out of a polar bear, because we were sort of talking about one of their special connectors that they make. And then probably equally, we have, you know, you've got your, you know, your tool companies, and you've got, you know, sort of glove companies, whatever. So, so we get a chunk of the money comes from that. But then also you have AdSense. So of course, with, um, with, you know, Google itself, obviously, they take a fair chunk of that money. Um, but of course, the more views you get, the better engagement that you get. Um, and also, depending on what sector you're in, I mean, so in automotive, we we do quite well from the AdSense. And so you get, you know, whatever that might be, anything from, I mean, it's quite low numbers, but it could be anything from like a fiver to a 20 pound, a thousand views. So you've got to get a lot of views to get that income to come in. But what's interesting is if you keep publishing sort of videos regularly, then you tend to have this kind of, it's almost like a tidal drag. And so basically your audience kind of comes with you and you actually get more views overall. So actually you'll end up sort of with a slightly higher revenue than if you just did it more sporadically. So it's been, we've done an awful lot of experimentation as we're going, going, you know, doing really regular stuff, very irregular stuff, different durations as well, because some people really like to sort of, I mean, our show when we first started, people would sit down at the weekend and sort of book out kind of 45 minutes to watch our show. But then we've also met other people who would say they don't watch so often because they don't have that length of time any one moment. They want like a 10 minute show or maybe a number of 10 minute shows. So I think, that's the other thing that's interesting about YouTube. It's got a massive worldwide audience, and therefore you've got all these other people with all these other things going on in their world. So, so, so that's sort of part of it. But I think the other interesting thing about the business side is that our audience is quite evenly spread. We went went to a lot of trouble to try and talk to our original Wheeler Dealers audience. So we did fifty translations a week, um, you know, for each of those videos, um, so people could watch it in other languages. Um, and in a way, the downside of that is you then actually kind of Despite, your, your, your audience basically covers the whole planet and then and it seems that a lot of advertisers you know like the americans obviously want you to both be talking to americans and then the europeans want you to talk to europeans and the uk again so you then find yourself sometimes between two stools because if you've got two two well spread audience it's great for your fans but it's not so great for the business side of things so people who are working exclusively in america and talking to americans will probably do better financially than if you are you know, going to all the different countries. So it's a bit of a balancing act, but I think um, it is kind of interesting. And obviously I'm already a kind of a global brand thanks to the Wheeler Dealers show. Um, and so that also, again, is sort of a, a blessing and, and, and a curse in a way, because obviously if you talk to some of the big global companies, usually they're divided up into lots of smaller sectors and trying to get all those sectors to talk as one is very hard to do. So, so we, what we're finding that it's easy, you know, I suppose we're finding a sweet spot of the advertisers that we need to talk to, because obviously if they're too small a company, they probably don't know how to benefit, if you like, from, you know, the, the exposure they're going to get. And we had a strange conversation with the chat a while back, where, well, not really strange, but it was just interesting that, you know, we were, you know, sort of charging just for a shout out on the show. And he said, well, I can get four magazine adverts for the same the same sort of money and it's like yeah but that magazine only has a readership of thirty thousand, and then it's an advert so nobody's even going to necessarily get that far in the magazine whereas of course we might have five hundred thousand views and we're actually using your product in the show and and we're talking about it and talking about its advantages and disadvantages and even you can even include a link of course in the description so you can actually go straight through to their sales process and and obviously that's so powerful but i think it's still bizarrely even though it's been around years and years and years it's still that new a medium that I think a lot of companies don't quite know what to do with it yet. And I think, you know, we're probably, you, you'd think with this many viewers and this many videos out there that we've kind of, you know, kind of starting to go down the other side, but I think it's only going to get bigger. I totally agree with you. If you can do a product placement like that and have a link, you know, yeah. and you're actually standing there and saying, you know, Punchline Talks is fantastic or punchlinegloster.com or, or Big Doug, as you got there. I noticed a nice bit of product placement there. You, uh, you saw the, that. <laughs> I, got, I saw that. I saw the racket there. I'm always interested in Big Doug because 
They're just down the road for me in Bristol Road. I live in Gloucester. And yeah. also they sponsor our fantastic Gloucester rugby team. Yes, well. yeah. so, so what's your connection with Big Dig then? They do all your well, racking. You've seen my workshop. It's quite messy, even when it's kind of tidy. And so you can never have too much racking. And I think what's really cool about the Big Dug stuff is obviously you've got everything from kind of, you can go good, better or best when it comes to the quality you go for. So depending on what your application is, I mean, my stuff is generally quite heavy. So we generally go for the other, the, the sort of the higher end of that, just because it's got to, physically take the, 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 the hassle um, but if you've got a little workshop at home then they've got something for you as well so I think that's quite nice but I think the cool thing about racking and being tidy is it gives you more room for more projects and what's not wrong about that <laughs> uh, and, and more chance but I've, my, my garage is full of the bloody stuff by the way I've, I've probably got far too much racking and not enough stuff put it put on it <laughs> can, I, can I talk about your earlier career were, were you always yeah. interested in cars then Ed how did that start well I kind of yeah I guess so I mean I was sort of I was never, I guess, when I was a Lego kid when I was really young, and I kind of knew a lot about what cars looked like, perhaps, growing up. But I, I didn't actually, hadn't really got into the mechanical nature until I bought my first car. It was a Beetle, um, and um, it failed its MOT immediately. And then I and I'd run out of money, so then I had to learn the hard way really quickly. And my, my parents had had minis, and so they had an Imperial socket set, a Beetle's metric. That was the first rule is, you know, use the right tools, otherwise you end up losing all your knuckles. Um, so I lost a fair few knuckles and then started buying the right tools. And I think, you know, so it kind of went from there. But it was for me, it was more the creativity, the kind of the freedom that it not only gives you, you know, especially as a teenager, you can kind of go off into the into the hills and have a wonderful time. But also you can actually kind of express yourself through your, you know, through your vehicle. And also you can explore, I guess, your own. Well, I mean, obviously, like, I like engineering. So, you know, you can explore how stuff is done and you can kind of apply those things to your own vehicle. So I, I think I just got kind of sucked into that world. And, and, and it was just you could build something and then you could go off, you know, sort of go test it out, crash, break down, whatever, and start again. And it was just very immediate. So I think, you know, from that point of view, it's very exciting. But also I don't like stock particularly. So interestingly with Wheeler Dealers, they managed to tie me down long enough to restore or kind of refurbish old classics or even modern classics. But obviously I guess my real passion is, you know, creating stuff that probably shouldn't be connected. So think, or going to create it. So things like the driving sofa cars and beds and bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. And again, that was obviously literally a combination of things that drive and things that shouldn't be on the road. And, you know, and, and then that was a, a kind of a business. It was, it was, it wasn't particularly profitable, but it was great fun. <laughs> I know that you, you, you drove a sofa, wasn't it? Or something like, I've got it written down here, 50, 87 miles an hour. The one, yeah. the fastest one, fastest furniture. That was 87. Yeah, that was it, yeah. uh, a hot desk, 87 yeah. miles an hour. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> publication. So how did you get into top gear then? And, and, you know, from messing yeah, around well, I guess things. Was that a like lucky it. break? Yeah, really. I mean, it was just kind of, uh, I mean, I did the one episode, to be fair, but we kind of did, um, I, when I was playing around with the cars, yeah, I, I started, I built the sofa. Um, well, we basically built a, a, a Beetle. I cut the roof off, went up the doors, covered it in fur. We drove down to the thing called Run to the Sun, went down to Newquay. And, and then Top Gear magazine spotted us there. And then we kind of did some pictures. And it was like, okay, maybe next year we should do better. And so then I kind of, I did this rally international things. So he had to raise money for that. So I thought, well, I'll make a soap. Everybody else is doing cake sales and car washing. I thought I'll build a car. It'll be so amazing. It'll get all this coverage. And then all these sponsors will have to give us money, which didn't entirely work out, but I ended up with the driving sofa. And then of course, Top Gear, again, we're interested in that. We did the live show, the very, very first one at Silverstone with them. And, and it just kind of went from there. And I guess, so we're just on the radar. And then we did a show uh, for BBC two for Panic Mechanic. And that was, really very much because I happened to be in custom car magazine at the time. We'd just done some stuff on, you know, one of the red tops and whatever. So it was kind of, we were just kind of everywhere they looked. So I probably should have haggled harder because I didn't realize how much they needed me, but then that was fantastic fun. And then of course, just because of that, I ended up going into, into wheeler dealers. And again, cause again, I was someone else's radar and the top gear thing was just nestling in there somewhere. I guess somebody had seen this crazy stuff we're doing. And I mean, and just, getting paid to play is just the best thing <laughs> so like i was going to say no <laughs> i mean you must be obviously you know you're, you're obviously a fantastic marketeer because at the end of the day this is what it's all about as well isn't it it's about getting you know dale vince here who runs eco tristy and he's got his green union jack i always say he's one yep. of the best marketeers in the country and, and we've got uh, uh julian duckerton here for super dry as well uh, yeah, again, yeah. it's fantastic marketeer or gets the right people around him I think you're pretty much the same. I mean, to get that many YouTube, you know, audience is quite phenomenal. But cheers. I think it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, I kind of, I guess I had a bit of a head start because obviously we had sort of fans from around the world, but it's an interesting thing also that, well, certainly with YouTube, people, 
they get to vote with their fingers if you like you know so so, so if they don't like what you're doing they're just not going to watch and and so you do have to you know people talk about you know sort of pleasing the algorithm but it is pleasing the audience and it's about making sure that you produce something that you would be proud of but every single time so that's quite a pressure and i think but it is also a kind of it is definitely marketing because you know our videos you know we, we go to a lot of trouble with all say making the 4k well lit well so sort of the sound is good we try and get really great music in it and stuff but then nobody's going to see any of that if they don't click on your little thumbnail and your title and stuff and that's something that we're working on now you know because you just understanding how potent or how powerful or how vital frankly it is to have any success on youtube is is if and it's the same as anything if you have a billboard um advert and stuff obviously if that makes people then go to the store to buy something then of course that's brilliant if it's a terrible billboard advert nobody's going to bother to following it through and i think it's even more the case with youtube so i think you're right it is about marketing and it is a really mad marketing exercise and it's interesting because youtube is also very kind of like a concentrated down uh, it's like the essence of of, of movie making or, or media in that if you think about a movie it's your movie poster it's your title obviously when they're trying to sell it to producers you know, it's about actually having the right title and the right sort of you know the, the one liner afterwards just to explain what the show is and if if you haven't got that message across in those two sort of sentences if you like then it's it you're lost and i think youtube is just that magnified up of course you don't get millions and millions of quid <laughs> if you're successful or you are well, some people do but i mean but that's the other thing there are so many kids out there making great content then it's quite hard to find, you know, sort of the, the bit that suits you. And of course, then it makes it sort of, there's a lot of people trying to earn a living now out of it, but it's quite great that you can, you know. And in some ways, there's actually too much, isn't there? You know, I, I meet a lot of kids and you say, what do you want to do? And they say, well, I want to be a YouTube star and stuff, but it's not that easy. There's a lot, a lot of <laughs> hard work that goes behind the scenes. I think a lot of people think it's easy, but it, it's it's bloody not. But it takes, well, it's like anything. It's that whole 10,000 hours or even 100,000 hours. And some like, if you look at Mr. Beast, you know, Jimmy's, you know, like the the the, the king of, of YouTube at the moment, but it took him ten years, um, and a constant sort of sort of he just studied and studied and studied about what he was doing. He experimented all the time. He's very scientific, even though you know he's not necessarily trained as a scientist. But he's going through every single moment, uh, and he, you know he they spent hours, days looking at the, the brightness of a thumbnail just to see whether that was more appealing than not, and whatever else they'll flick them up at different times as they're putting up videos because they can react to that data as they're going. And I think. It is, a, you know, like any business, you know, you need to you need to do something and see what happens and then obviously change your work accordingly, I guess. And and it's it's like, well, again, actually like working on a car, if you're trying to fix something, it makes a lot of sense to only change one thing at a time. And I think we're all guilty of getting overexcited. And certainly we did early on with, with the YouTube stuff. We're changing all kinds of stuff. And, and, so, and so the data becomes a bit wobbly. Um, and I think now we're going to go through a phase of just being very, very sort of regimented in actually how we change stuff so that you get a really nice progression and that you know the thing you just changed was the reason why it was better or worse. You know? So obviously the, the YouTube thumbnail is, is extremely important, keeping that really nice and bright. What about tr traditional other media, um, you know, getting into national magazines, newspapers? That's, is that still uh, relevant as it used to be or just as important? I think it is, but I think it depends because you've got, you know, the audience, there's many, many people don't look at YouTube, frankly. So I think it's a generational thing. I think, you know, obviously there's there's sort of people our age obviously tend to understand or, or live in a world of current media, if you like, or traditional media. And I think it's obviously the much younger generation who, you know, because I guess they think that YouTube's been around forever when it really hasn't and TikTok and whatever else. So I think you do, you do need a, a proper marketing mix, but you also have to understand your audience. And I think that's probably one of those kind of business tips is like probably most important than anything else is know your audience. <laughs> well, that leads me very nicely, actually, to your top three business tips, actually, Ed. So what are they, sir? Well, know your audience. <laughs> that's the uh -huh. first one. Yeah. Thank goodness that's for that. that. Yeah, so well, that's, that's this good. Is where I'm failing terribly, but then... <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's that's double that, but it's really important, and it's more important than you imagine, I think, and and it's often quite hard early on to understand what that's about, you know, and who they are and stuff. But it, it's it's kind of there's definitely a vital vital thing. And I think also, you know, I'm I'm terrible at uh, sort of trying to do everything myself, and obviously I'm I'm quite good at you know many things, but not an expert at anything, of course, and actually what you really want to do is you want to find you want to delegate i suppose and so you should not try to do everything on your own you should try and get people around you you know as branson always said you know get people who are better than you at doing all those important jobs so i think that's also quite key to make sure you've got the right people and it's not an easy thing to do um and i think the other thing is it's probably i guess you know you need you need to do something you're really passionate about because there will always be really hard times and if you can't drag yourself through that stuff 
um, or find a good enough distraction to get you back there, then 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 it's, it's it's no good at all. But I suppose part of that really is if you think about if you go and try and borrow money from a bank for a business idea, if they're not interested, then maybe you should try and change your business idea because obviously you know it, it's quite good to not use your own money if you can, because uh, it's quite a good acid test as to whether the idea is going to stand up for itself. No, oh, absolutely fantastic. And um, um, what's next for you guys then? Oh, sorry, I got to, one other thing is you talk about other people around you. Yeah. Who else? Who else is helping you? They have you got a sound guy? Have you got a camera guy? Is it is it you? Yeah, we have a lot. Of, we have a lot of um, sort of stuff we bring in depending on what we're doing. So we have camera and edits and stuff. And obviously, my wife Imogen does um, tons and tons of production and whatever else. And so we kind of work as a team from that point of view. And and then really, it's just a case of hiring the people in that you know you need at the right time. Because obviously, again, though you might better do it yourself with an iPhone, it looks much better if somebody's actually got it in focus with the right lighting. And how did you teach yourself to walk and talk, by the way? Because that's one of the hardest things. <laughs> well, I think I kind of, I was talking out of the womb. I think the walking thing came later. So. <laughs> thanks ever so much. I just want to say thanks ever so much for your, day, your time today. And really great to meet you. And thanks for uh, putting on such a great show. Very welcome. See you soon, hopefully. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. See you soon.